Stacy Kelly is our last speaker. Um, she is the Assistant Conservator of Works on Paper at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. She received her MA in Conservation from Northumbria University in the UK with specialization in works of art on paper. She was a 2015 to 2017 Fellow in Paper Conservation at the Eamon Carter Museum. And she has had held internships at the Gluckman Conservation Studio at the University of Aberdeen and the Alnwick Castle in the UK. <laughs> Um, and her talk today has a very long name. So characterization of the aniline dyes in the colored papers of Jose Posada's prints using time of flight secondary ion mass spectroscopy to aid in developing a treatment protocol for the removal of pressure sensitive tapes. So my presentation today is gonna cover research that I conducted when I was a fellow at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. And I did this while working together with the University of Texas at Dallas um, with their chemistry department. So I gave this talk at the AIC um, BPG RATS uh, joint session in May, so I know some of you have already heard it. And just bear with me, especially since I know we are over time and everybody wants to go to the reception. Um, so I'll start off with a short introduction about Posada's broadsides in the Eamon Carter Museum's collection, their condition, and the issues that led to the development of this research. I will then cover the characterization of the dyes in five different Posada prints, the results obtained, and what they mean. Next, I will describe the experiment that I conducted exploring the removal of oxidized adhesives from paper samples containing soluble dyes. I will discuss the results of these methods and then conclude. So, Jose Guadalupe Posada was a Mexican artist that was active during the turn of the 20th century. He has been dubbed by many scholars as the father of modern Mexican printmaking. And during his time, he produced thousands of illustrations, and that number ranges from 2,000 to 20,000. And his work was extremely influential and paramount to the development of modern Mexican art, and he influenced many artists, including Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco. The Eamon Carter Museum has a large collection of Posada's work, with approximately 400 prints attributed to him. The collection is in relatively good condition, with many of the broadsides retaining their bright colors. Unfortunately, a group of these prints have been identified as high priority treatment items due to the presence of oxidized pressure sensitive tape. And this uh, oxidized tape is penetrating and weakening the short fibered papers. Adding complication to this issue, is the fact that the dyes that give these prints their vivid colors are synthetic organic dyes, which are also known as aniline dyes. And these are extremely soluble in many solvents. And unfortunately, common tape removal techniques in a paper conservator's arsenal involve the use of solvents. So this problem led to the development of this research project, which was to characterize aniline dyes in Posada's prints in order to develop a treatment protocol that will keep the highly soluble dyes intact during treatment. This research would not just impact the Carter or institutions with Posada prints. Because aniline dyes were used extremely broadly, they can be found in many turn of the 20th century documents and prints. Analysis of dyes on works on paper is extremely difficult. When it comes to analyzing works of art, non-destructive in situ analysis is preferred. And if samples are taken, they have to be so inconsequential that the integrity and the appearance of the object are not altered. Traditional methods of dye analysis require relatively large samples, which is not possible for works on paper. Adding complication to this is the fact that aniline dyes have high tinting strengths, resulting in extremely low dye content within a sample. A study in 2010 by Casario et al. used FT Raman with success to identify some of the dyes in Posada's prints. Unfortunately, FT Raman was not able to characterize all the dyes, particularly the yellow dyes in the yellow Posada prints. Raman techniques look at the vibrations of the bonds within a molecule, and some dyes, particularly yellow dyes, do not produce unique vibrational frequencies to identify it from a list of possibilities. As such, we decided to use a mass spectrometry method to complement the results obtained from this previous study. So, time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry, top sims, and I'm not gonna say that anymore, is a surface analytical technique that uses extremely small samples and little to no sample preparation. It has been used in a variety of applications, including the study of polymers, 
investigating surface changes in textiles, organic pigment analysis, and the identification of dyes on textiles. So in top sims, the surface of the sample is bombarded by high energy ions, which leads to the ejection of both neutral and charged species from the surface of the sample. And these e ejected molecules are accelerated to a specific energy at a fixed distance, and then detected with an analyzer which produces a spectra. So first, small samples were cut from a historic dye manual that's contemporary to Posada's prints. And these samples were used to determine the appropriate setting for TopSIMS analysis. These were also really useful in gauging the feasibility of using top sims with dyes on paper. After these parameters were established, five Posada prints from the Eamon Carter Museum's collection was um, selected for analysis based on color and dye intensity. Each print was sampled by gently scraping a tungsten needle over an existing loss and then gathering the fibers onto double-sided copper tape. So there you have the top sims um, machine that looks like something from science fiction show. And then here you have the dye samples from the dye mino, which you can see in the top picture inside the chamber. So here are the five Prasada prints that were analyzed from our collection. And I just want to mention that the losses are pre-existing losses and are not caused by sampling. So. SIMS provides both elemental and molecular information on a submicron scale. Each peak in the spectra is a data point which relates to a particular structure or chemical fragment. And to identify the components in a sample, the ions in the spectrum must first be identified. And these ions will indicate how the molecule breaks apart. And then working backwards, it is then possible to establish the molecu molecular structure that um, the ions came from. So here we have a table that shows the unique peaks for each fiber analyzed in both the positive and negative ion mode. And the samples in this study, we have to remember, have two components. The first component is the paper, and the second component, the dye. So it is first necessary to identify the common ions that are associated with the paper, and then the remaining ions are used to work out which organic dye is present inside the sample. So here, the fibers have common peaks that are highlighted in white, and these indicate that the peaks come from the paper, and that the papers are most likely the same or similar, probably wood pulp. And the remaining numbers are the unique peaks for each fiber that come from the dye. So aided by the previous study by Casario in 2010, together with historical papers and books listing commonly used aniline dyes, the dyes in the Posada prints were characterized through a process of deductive reasoning. So, first, we list out the possible dyes that could have been used to achieve the color in the papers. For example, in the magenta sample, we determined that these are the possible dyes that could have been used. We then look at the chemical structures of these dyes and compare them to the spectra obtained from top sims analysis. Here I've highlighted the unique peaks associated with the dye in the magenta fiber. And some of these peaks indicate the presence of bromine and chlorine ions. We then compare the peaks that stand out, which was in this case bromine and chlorine, to the chemical structures of the possible dyes. Phylloxine, a common pink dye used in the paper dyeing industry during Posada's time, has a relatively unique molecular structure containing both bromine and chlorine ions, which led to its identification. So here's a table that shows the results of the top sims analysis for all five of the Posada prints. And these dyes I identified are in the second to last column on the right. And the successful identification of methanol yellow in the yellow Posada print is significant because yellow dyes are so difficult to characterize that I mentioned before. And these findings corresponded to the studies, uh, to the results obtained from the 2010 FT Raman study of the dyes in Posada's prints, which further validated the methodology used in this project. These results also confirm that TOPSIMS is a good method for the identification of dyes in works of art on paper. And with this information, we were better armed with the understanding of the known sensitivities of these dyes with regard to treatment. So I'll now move on um, and go through an experiment that was set up with the aim of identifying a suitable method for the removal of oxidized pressure sensitive tape and adhesive from works on paper containing soluble dyes. So first I purchased a group of surrogate samples from eBay, looking specifically for ephemera made in the time frame of Jose Posada's prints. So I purchased both a group of colored and non-colored um, samples. I then divide, divided them according to this diagram, allowing the testing of the removal of a variety of tapes and adhesives, as well as a variety of methods. So the types of tapes and adhesives that I tested were Scotch Magic Tape, 3M2214 paper tape, 
gum brown paper tape, and rubber cement. The three removal techniques tested include solvent and suction table, solvent and gel and gel, and Gore-Tex with solvent. And these are the samples after being divided according to the diagram. And yes, I know I'm going to conservation hell, but um, it's fine. <laughs> um, I then put the samples and they underwent accelerated aging until the tape deterioration mimicked the deterioration seen in the Posada prints, which was basically stage two, stage three deterioration. And then using the T's chart, a variety of solvents were selected ranging in polarities, including aromatic solvents, chlorine solvents, and ketones. As adhesive ages, it becomes more polar and requires more polar solvents to remove. However, the higher the polarity of the solvent, the more likely the dyes in the paper will also solubilize. So the challenge here lay in finding a solvent that will solubilize the adhesive while keeping the dyes intact. So the first priority was to identify the solvents that would work well with the paper and not solubilize the dye. Absorbency tests were conducted on the controls. The samples were placed over Wattman filter paper and a drop of solvent was deposited onto the surface. The time taken for the solvent to be absorbed in the paper was measured. The formation of tie lines and bleeding of the dye were also noted to keep track of dye solubility. Next. Preliminary adhesive reduction tests were done to identify the solvents capable of solubilizing the various adhesives. The samples were flooded with solvent and the adhesive scraped off. Effectiveness in removing the adhesive as well as bleeding of the dye were taken into account. This narrowed the final selection of solvent for each color and adhesive combination. And during this process, a handheld UV torch was used to keep track of dye bleeding as well as adhesive residue inside the paper. So here we have a table that shows the selection of solvent for each color and adhesive combination. You can see that the selected solvents were mostly the least, were more of the least polar solvents from the original solvents that were tested, which you can see again in the T's chart. Before testing out the various tape removal options, the carriers of the tape were removed mechanically with heat where possible, and gel and gel samples were humidified before treatment. And these were just steps that were done to simulate real treatment practice. So the first treatment method evaluated was the use of solvents on the suction table, which is a very common method that we use. The solvent was applied locally using a dropper or swab to the rectal of the sample, and approximately four applications of solvent were done for each sample. This method was very effective in terms of removing the solubilized adhesive residue from the samples. It showed good results on samples with and without carriers still attached. Tight lines formed during treatment but were mostly controllable. However, bleeding of the pink and yellow samples occurred. And this method was not suitable for fragile samples as it can cause additional stress and damage, which you can see here. And here you can see the before and after treatment images of the yellow rubber cement sample. And while the treatment method was effective, losses in the dye were observed, which you can see under UV here. The next treatment method we will discuss is gel and gel with solvent. It's worth mentioning at the time that the Eamon Carter had a large supply of gel and gel, which I won at a lucky draw at the end of a gel conference. So we were very open to testing any sort of treatment method that involved gel and gel. For use with paper artifacts, gel and gel is usually prepared in a range of two to four percent to create a semi-rigid layer. I made a three percent gel and gel to ensure high absorption and minimize the release of moisture from the gel. The diagram here shows the treatment setup. Solvent was applied to the underside of the gel and placed on samples in 15 minute intervals. Solvents applied using gel and gel did not provide very good results. The solvent when brushed on did not penetrate the gel and it resulted in an immediate release of solvent once the loaded gel was applied to the surface of the support. So there was no controlled release of the solvent. As such, this treatment was not very effective, particularly so for samples with carriers, which prevented the solvent from penetrating. In addition, severe tight lines were noted in many samples due to pooling of the solvent on the surface. And solubilization of the dyes occurred, causing the dyes to be absorbed inside the gel matrix. This showed that solvents not miscible in water could not be incorporated into the gel matrix and therefore did not result in a functional solvent gel. Other possible variations to this method could be the use of an intermediate solvent that can bond to both the water in the gel as well as the solvent that you wish to use or try using different gels like xanthan or um, agarose. Here you can see an example of the tight lines that formed during gel and gel treatment. You can also see the dye that has solubilized and been absorbed into the gel matrix during treatment. The loss of dye in some samples showed a visible change in color in the treated area, which was not acceptable. So the last method I will talk about is the use of Gore-Tex with solvent. The Gore-Tex membrane has a pore size of 0.2 microns, allowing ultra-fine particles to permeate through the membrane, thereby allowing the controlled release of solvent. 
Initial testing confirmed that the tested solvents will not affect the Gore-Tex or the polyester felt it is bonded to. The diagram here shows the setup for the Gore-Tex sandwich, which was placed on the affected area of the samples in 12 minute intervals. An interleaving layer of Japanese paper was applied over the adhesive to absorb it as it swelled. As the adhesive swelled, the interleaving paper was removed and any soft surface adhesive was also scraped off using a spatula. The Japanese interleaving as well as the Gore-Tex were changed as needed. Gore-Tex and solvent was an effective method for the reduction of adhesives. While staining was reduced, they were still slightly visible. The method was effective on samples with and without carriers, and for samples with carriers, the Gore-Tex was kept in place as the carrier was removed, which you can see in the image on the right. Treatment times were approximately 10 to 15, 12 minute applications and could possibly go on longer with a greater improvement in results. And here's an example of the yellow masking tape sample after four 12 minute Gore-Tex applications. And you can see that the surface adhesive has been greatly reduced with no bleeding of the dye or tight lines. And here you can see the before and after treatment of the purple rubber cement sample. And Gore-Tex treatment reduced the adhesive residue and no tie lines and bleeding of the dye was noted. Now just for a quick recap about all the methods that were tested. So solvent and suction was an effective method in the reduction of adhesive residue and staining, but because it's such a forceful method, a lot of dye bleed occurred. Gel and gel does not work well with um, solvents non-miscible in water, and an intermediary, intermediary solvent is needed. In the case of working with soluble dyes, it is not the treatment of choice due to limitations in solvent selection. And because there was no controlled release of solvent, severe tight lines and bleeding of the dyes occurred. However, gel and gel is an extremely effective method for brown paper tape removal because it doesn't require any manipulation of the samples as the carrier and adhesive lift off the samples with the gel and no bleeding or tie lines occurred with that. Gore-Tex and solvent was effective in reducing adhesive. Stains were reduced but still visible but no dye bleeding occurred and minimal tie lines occurred. So it's important to remember that the purpose of this research was to reduce the adhesive on the prints and not so much reduce stains. And that achievement would have been considered a bonus. So due to the gen gentle treatment provided by the Gore-Tex option, as well as the lack of dye bleed, I decided to further tweak the methodology to see if I could obtain better results. So I created a second set of samples with the exact same parameters. And this time, two methods were, te were tested. The single Gore-Tex sandwich applied as described before, as well as a double Gore-Tex sandwich applied to the rectal and verso of the samples. The interleaving paper was applied only to the rectal, and application times remained at 12 minutes. After absorbency, dye stability tests, and adhesive removal tests, toluene was selected as the appropriate solvent for clear tape, masking tape, and rubber cement removal on the green samples. So here we have the before and after images with the single Gore-Tex sandwich, and the results were extremely promising. So here you can see a marked reduction of adhesive and staining for all three adhesives. And what is noticeable here are the tight lines that did form. And this is because I cut the Gore-Tex sandwich exactly the size of the treated area when I did my preparation. So as the adhesive solubilized, it um, spread laterally inside the support. And to avoid this, I would recommend cutting your Gore-Tex at least one quarter inches larger all around in the treated area. So here are the before and after images of the double Gore-Tex sandwich samples. So once again, don't be alarmed by the tie lines as this was due to the size of the Gore-Tex that I had cut and can definitely be reduced and chased during treatment. And with the double sandwich, you can see the extremely effective reduction of adhesive residue and staining inside the samples. And this was also achieved at a much faster rate, and it took about eight to 16 applications versus the 16 to 20 of the single Gore-Tex sandwich. And I also included here the spectrophotometer readings of the control area and the taped area after treatment, showing how close the L star, A star, and B star values are. And most of the readings have less than a 1.0 difference, which indicates that the after treatment areas are visibly and numerically identical to the controls. Conclusion. So firstly, top sims was found to be an effective method for the analysis of dyes on paper. And by characterizing the dyes, we could better understand the sensitivities of the aniline dyes in Posada's prints, thereby directing our solvent choice for safe treatment. Less polar solvents like toluene, xylene, and methane chloride were the solvents of choice for most dye and tape combinations. And this table shows the effectiveness of various solvents on the three tapes and adhesives from non-polar options to more polar without taking the account the dyes in the paper. 
And using this table together with the understanding of the dye sensitivities in the paper, you get a solid starting point for choosing your solvents. So from my testing, I felt that, tol that solvent was toluene. But it is important to remember that absorbency and dye stability tests are paramount. I also included here the threshold limit values in parts per million to aid in making an informed solvent choice. So please use appropriate PPE and ventilation. Gore-Tex with solvent treatment was extremely effective and using a double sandwich achieved excellent results while decreasing treatment times. Lateral movement of the adhesive will occur and it is recommended to cut Gore-Tex to at least one quarter inch larger than the treated area. With Gore-Tex treatment, no bleeding of the dye occurred, which leads to the idea that you can consider more polar solvents. And please do appropriate testing before treatment. Unfortunately, Gore-Tex is no longer manufactured, but a comparable option is now available through conservation by design called Hydra Air PGFE. It is made <coughs> using the same materials but has a pore size of about two microns. So it would be worth trying, but with a less saturated blotter to reduce the rate of transfer. And finally, this is the methodology that was used and is still being used on the Eamon Carter Museum's Posada collection. So I just want to thank the following people here for their help, or this treatment wouldn't have been possible. Questions? Any questions? Yes. So, stay, uh, Stacey, this is wonderful. I, I wish I had seen this talk uh, 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 about two years ago because I had a, about a year and a half ago, I had to work on a Diego Rivera print that looked exactly like that. And it was, it was, a, it was hell. Um, it was pink and it bled like crazy. And it was, um, and I mean, I hit it with everything. And actually, the only thing that I could find that didn't cause bleeding was to actually, um, I ended up using, if I remember correctly, it was, um, it was bouncing between. Uh, toluene and xylene, but I ended up um, mixing it into a paste with uh, kaolin powder, what I would apply to that spot after I got the carrier off, and then I would wait till it, it dried, desiccated out, and then I would scrape off the, the kaolin powder, and it oh. ended up bouncing it back and forth, and I mean, it was days of scraping, and so I wish I had seen this. This is really, really nice. Thank and you. The dyes are so fugitive. I mean, you look yeah. at them and they bleed, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just have a question about the gel in gum. Did you um, try beveling the gel and see if that controlled the tide line or um, the solvent? I tried mm -hmm. in other experiments, so I did a bunch of other things outside of the of this experiment. So I didn't have any of that recorded. But I've tried. I, I really tried a lot with gelin, but I think it's go, it just it doesn't work. And I do think it's got to do with the fact that there it's 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 a high. It, it requires water to make, and when that water contacts the the dyes, they just they bleed. But maybe agarose. I'm, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Did you try using heat or warmth for removing the tape? I didn't want to use. Oh, oh, for the. Um, I didn't want to use heat because the papers are so. They're just so brittle and dry and of really poor quality, and I just I just wasn't really comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, when I think of paper conservation, I think of how holistic it is. Uh -huh. So I was a little horrified to see methylene chloride in the list of solvents that you use there. So how prevalent is it in, in, in your practice? Not usually, um, but I have used um, xylene um, in the past and I don't usually use methylene chloride, which is also why I included the table because it tells you, you know, how safe you, you I mean, you make a choice about how safe you want to be. But I use, I wore, wore a mask, I used gloves, I was really, really careful. And I don't spend the entire day working on it. And you're talking about a very small amount because, I mean, you're using Gore-Tex and you're, you're only working on a really tiny area. And so you can really control how much solvent you are exposed to. So it's not usually something that we would go to at all. Yeah. That's it. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you.